Hello everyone, I am International Master Radkovic Milovan. Welcome. In the next three hours we are going to talk about outposts. So let's say a couple of words about this very important motive in chess. So what is an outpost? That's a square, basically protected square, where we put some or our pieces. Also this square cannot be uh, attacked by our opponent's pawns, basically. Sometimes our opponent can attack that square with some of his pawns, but in that case he will he will significantly weaken his position or he will create some new weaknesses in his position. Yeah, what should we do with outpost with this square? We should put some of our pieces there. Which pieces? We could put different pieces, but basically when we say outpost, we think about knights. So knights are perfect there. Why knights? Because uh, knight is a piece with short range. So uh, it would be good to have our knights very close to our opponent's pieces. For example, to our opponent's king, that would be great. Or uh, close to some other important uh, pieces. Um, of course, yeah, as I said, it is possible to have some other pieces there, but basically we are going to talk about knights, outposts for knights. Many times outpost is, is, is weak square, a hole in our opponent's position. So what should we do? We should put our knight there, then, uh, then develop other pieces and create very strong pressure on our opponent's position. When we talk about knights, you already know that knights are our best, most effective in the center. So it would be good to create outposts in the center or somewhere in, in, in the middle of our opponent's position. Uh, of course, we cannot say that the outpost is a, a square near our king, like where our knight doesn't do anything or, you know, doesn't attack anything. Outpost is a square in the center or very close to uh, our opponent's pieces, which uh, where, where our knight creates some threats, attacks some, some, some different uh, targets uh, and so on. So uh, in, in this course, we are going to, to, to see, to analyze some, some very interesting and instructive games where one side created outpost for the knight, put the knight there and won the game because of that. So let's get started. We are now going to analyze the first game. This is the game played in 1993. White is Grandmaster Pickett and Black is Grandmaster Smearing, it is white to play. What would you play here? Let's talk about this position. Let's try to, to analyze it, to try to evaluate it. White has more space, that's clear. White pieces are well placed. I mean, white is ahead in development. He's clearly better. But uh, there is a very, very good plan for white. And after doing that, white will have clear advantage, it will be basically positionally winning position for white. What should white do here? Let's talk about knights. This knight on f3 is good. It attacks this backward e5 pawn, so it creates like constant pressure on that pawn. So it's, it's basically good there. On the other hand, this knight on c3 looks nice, but it doesn't do so much. It blocks the bishop on b2. Also, it cannot jump here or here. Or, yeah, it can jump to a4, but it doesn't do anything there. So, basically, it would be good to do something with this knight. You probably already noticed what is the, 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 the weakest square in black position. What is whole in black position? It is this square, the d6 square. It would be fantastic if we could bring the c3 knight to this square. Of course, it is possible to, that, to do that. And Grandmaster Piquet did that by playing knight b1. 
So uh, white brings his knight via d2 and c4 to the outpost on d6. This is the point. What happened then? Black played knight e6 and then of course white played knight bd2. Black played knight d4. He's trying to exchange pieces and to simplify position. Then why not knight c4? You see that white gives his light square bishop. Now uh, this is not so important because this knight on d4 is not bad. It's good knight. So yeah, it's good for white to, to give that bishop and to take the d4 knight. It's like good trade for white. So knight goes to c4. Of course, the next move is going to be knight d6. Knight takes e2 was played and then white, of course, took b6 was played. So black is trying to undermine this pawn chain. Very nice pawn chain, you see. So that is why he, he played b6. Then, of course, knight went to d6. And d6 square is, is like, as we said, ideal square for the knight. And after placing, after positioning that knight there, white has clear advantage. Now let's see how white won this game. Uh, let's see just the execution now. So queen e6 was played. And then, I mean, these two rooks are out of play. They are doing nothing. So let's try to activate them. Rook fd1 was played. So white sacrificed a pawn, the c5 pawn, but he gained very, very strong initiative, very strong attack. Let's take a look. B takes c5 was played. Then rook from a1 goes to c1. C takes b4 was played. And then rook takes c6. Now there is a pin on the sixth rank. B takes a3, bishop takes a3. Uh, right now black is a pawn up, but it is clear that white is better because white pieces are much more active. White already has some concrete threats. Uh, black pieces are, are poorly placed and it's very very hard for him to, to untie his pieces. What did he play? He played rook d8 in order to protect the knight. Then white just did this. Rook dc1. Uh, there are several reasons why he did this. Uh, he Right now he cannot move the knight because the rook on c6 is hanging. So let's protect the rook. And that's not all. At the same time white attacks this bishop three times. So right now the bishop on c8 is hanging. So what did black play? He found only defense. He played queen g8. And then white increased his pressure. So he played rook c7. Black played a5. Now this is uh, like a desperate position for for black. Uh, like he's, he's completely lost here. So he's trying to just to, 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 to do something here. Uh, he had the idea to play bishop a6. To try to develop that bishop with tempo. But we will see that it's, it's, uh, it's like uh, no way that he can save the game. White played queen b5. Attacking the knight. Now there is knight takes c8 threat. When black takes with one of his rooks. Then rook takes d7. Then black played bishop a6 with tempo, attacking the queen, and then white played one unbelievable move. Very, very strong move. He took the knight on d7 with his queen. Now let's see wh why he did this. Black took and white took. White wants to do this in the next move. Rook c c7, and then this bishop cannot be protected, basically. Black played rook d8 to try to uh, trade some pieces to uh, reduce pressure, but of course not. White doesn't want to exchange. Bishop e2 was played, and then knight takes e5. This pawn is hanging, so why not to take it? Queen a2, rook c, c7. Rook g8, and then after playing knight e8, black resigned. Why did he resign? I will show you. Let's see one scenario. For example, if black takes the bishop on a3, then white could simply play knight f6 check. King has to go there, and then knight takes 
g6 checkmate basically checkmate is unavoidable okay why this happened because white found very very good plan he he saw that uh, d6 square is weak that this square is a hole so he just brought his c3 knight there again not def3 knight it is also possible to play knight d2 knight c4 knight d6 but this knight on f3 is very strong it attacks this uh this backward e5 pawn our knight on c3 on the other hand is doing almost nothing there so let's bring it on d6 